Good morning, brothers and sisters. We apologize for the technical difficulties. Shall we seek the Lord's guidance as we enter into a study of his word? Gracious Father in heaven, you know our situation. <clears throat> We've been entering into technical difficulties today. There are many things that we need to ad address, many things that we are seeing from your scripture, from this instruction book that you have provided us. We pray, Father, that we may have open minds, that we may di be directed in the path that you would have us to follow for this time in this world's history. Guide us today, be with us, help us so that we may willingly walk with you and may see the things that we need now most so that we may learn to draw closer to you. For this, we thank you. For this, Father, we praise you. In the name of Jesus, amen. Yeah. Okay. So as we, as we left things off yesterday, we were in the sections here in the book of Judges where Caleb has given the challenge where, and Caleb has said, he that smiteth Kerjath Sefer and taketh it, to him I will give Aksah, my daughter, to wife. And Othmiel, the son of Kenaz, Caleb's younger brother, took it and he gave him Aksah, his daughter, to wife. We saw this before in the book of Joshua, but it's being repeated again for us at this time. Now, as this portion continued, and it came to pass, when she, Aksa, came to him, which we identified as her new husband, that she had moved him, Othniel, to ask of her father a field. And she lighted off her ass. She came off from the symbol of Islam, and Caleb said unto her, What wilt thou? And she said unto him, Aksa said to Caleb, Give me a blessing, for thou hast given me a south land. Give me also springs of water. And Caleb gave her the upper springs and the nether springs. So as we were talking about this, are we looking that this could be a, a further symbol of what occurred in 1888? Are we seeing that <coughs> Oxa can represent the movement and that Caleb could represent God and Othniel, the Holy Spirit. What are we seeing here? What are your thoughts? So we had sorted out that, okay, Stephen, Stephen, you go. Yeah, I was going to say about 1888, it wouldn't have maybe the symbolism of the ass connected with that history. Okay. okay. Mm -hmm. But would the, would the symbol of the ass be connected with 1844?
I mean, it's definitely connected with 1840. Well, yes, that would have a more relevant for that time. So would this be, yeah, I, I, 1842, October right. 22nd, 1844. Okay. So where would we place this in our history? The 1530. Well, we're just doing the repeat of Millerite history to the Sunday law. Okay. What else? This is placing it in our time in its repeat of. Okay. Time. So if we're placing this in our time, where could we be placing Oxaw's lighting from off the ass? Is it more relevant to place it September 11, 2001, or would it be more relevant to place it with the warning of July 18th? Uh, well, I would place it with July 18th when you apply it to this movement. Okay. Okay, any other thoughts? Okay. And the children of the Kenite, Moses' father-in-law, went up out of the city of palm trees and the children of Judah into the wilderness of Judah, which lieth in the south of Arad. And they went and dwelt among the people. Now we've identified the city of palm trees as being Jericho. Why is it important that the children of, Ju of Judah went into the wilderness of Judah, which lieth to the south of Arad? What are we seeing here? What can we take from this? I mean, if we're looking using Strong's numbers, a rad would come to Hebrew 6166. It is yeah. Used, it's used five times in the script. Okay, that's interesting. Okay. with the meaning being to sequester itself or fugitive. What can we see here? I have a definition here that says it's a uh... Fugitive, but also a wild ass. Okay. I think that ties in well.
so what, how can we apply this, this example? I mean, it's used primarily as the name of a person, the name of a king. So it's, it's intriguing to me that we would have this land that lieth south of Arad, south of the fugitive or south of Islam. You are recording, good. Thank you. So, Aksa asks for this blessing. Caleb grants the blessing. And the father of the Kenite, Moses' father-in-law, who we have identified as Hobab and Jethro, went up out of the city of palm trees with the children of Judah into the wilderness of Judah. And they went and they dwelt among the people. The children of the Kenite, these are Midianites, but it's one particular group of the Midianites that are now joined with the children of Judah. Why would this be important? I mean, how many times was the children of Israel instructed not to enter into a covenant with the people of the land? Now, I'll grant you, the children of the Kenite, Moses' father-in-law, those of the priests of Midian, joining with the children of Judah does not look to me to be the same as, as entering into a covenant with the Canaanites. Because Moses' father-in-law had an understanding of the true God. Yet, we know that many of the Midianites were not worshipers of the true God. Not in complete spirit and truth. They also wouldn't be dwelling in the land of Canaan. They would be more like sojourners. Right. So why they are... Way, why this is occurring, we do not have a, a direct understanding at this point. If we if we look a little further at this. Recording in progress. If we take a look at this a little further, we wind up having to consider why the Kenite is choosing to live with the children of Judah and why they've gone now into the wilderness of Judah. So the following verse, and Judah went with Simeon, his brother, and they slew the Canaanites that inhabited Zephath and utterly destroyed it. And the name of the city was called Hormah. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yes, you're back. Okay. Yeah. So um, I missed all of that, but we have to address some points here. Okay. Back in verse 16 that we had talked about. All right. Um, yesterday. So, um, just have to bring this up. Why is it not opening? Okay. So we had talked about this 16, uh, 116, and we had compared it to uh, 34.3. Right. That is Deuteronomy 34.3. Because we are dealing with the city of palm trees, which is Jericho. Right. So, so we haven't addressed that yet today. And my computer's just taking a while to open things up here. But um, so, um, 
I'll share my Bible. So we'll look at these verses. Okay, so you want me to stop share? Um, yeah, stop sharing there. There you go. <clears throat> yeah, and Iran's recording this, so we get all the stuff that I missed because I had to restart my internet. Um, so if we go to uh, Deuteronomy 34.4, so that's the first place we have the city of palm trees mentioned. And I have to share my screen. Just it's, it's, Everything's slow because it's all opening up. Uh, it's 34.3, and the south and the plain of the valley of Jericho, the city of the Palms. I don't know why, just hang on. I have to share this again. There we go. So 34.3. It's not sharing the screen. Oh, there it is. And, and the south and the plain of the valley of Jericho, the city of palm trees, unto Zoar. And I still have an unstable uh, internet. So I'm not sure what the problem is with the internet here today, but it's probably just the internet itself. So the city of palm trees is Jericho. Can we agree on that? Right. And that's in Deuteronomy 34, verse 3. So the idea behind that is that is of the 777 chiasm, we have a division uh, that we see illustrated in the, we, the, um, the 70 weeks. That is, if you take right. okay. 7 times 7 times 7, you get 343, and that is the first 7 weeks times the last week. And if that's added to the 434 years of the 62 weeks, that you come to the number 777. So this is something we've illustrated many times before. Now, what I want to show you is um, not opening up. So I have no idea why. It's probably just because I have to restart everything. Okay. And my PowerPoint's not responding. Now, um, so there was another point. Well, we know that when we go to the story of Joshua, and we have the seven times, that's when they're conquering Jericho. And they go around the city uh, seven days. And then on the seventh day, they go about the city seven times. So what's the significance of that? What, what, how do we understand the, the, the seven connected with Jericho? Manifestation of the power of God. Okay, well, it is a manifestation of the power of God, though we usually we apply that to the Exodus, wonderful manifestation of the power of God in 1533. We apply it to the Sunday law. Okay, so to the Sunday law, and and why is that? Uh, 
the um, it's like the church triumphant at the end of the world and um, relating to the Sabbath Sunday law issue. Okay. And when we have our 777 structure, we have symbolically at the end, December 25th, which becomes a symbol of the Sunday law as well, correct? Okay. Yes. And why is December 25th a symbol of the Sunday law? Well, in 274 AD, um, Aurelian, the emperor, he uh, dedicated the temple there on the 25th of December to uh, Sol Invictus, which is uh, the unconquerable sun. Okay. And Anything else about December 25th? So, I mean, that's pretty important. Um, that it, it's, it's connected to the worship of the sun. Now, what about Jehoiachin being released from prison on the 25th day of the 12th month? Yeah, so that's connected um, to 666 years. Okay, right. So the 666 is a symbol of the Sunday law. Which we get in, in Revelation chapter 13. Anything else? Well, we had addressed how that could be part of that of that seven 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 chiasm of our time. Right. So, so the explain explain what you mean by that. Well, didn't we look at this where? the the 777 chiasm for our time after july 18th was indicating a period more of preparation for the movement itself okay so the december 25th 2021 date it wasn't a sunday law so what was it? I'm trying to remember what we what we had discussed that tying into. Well, we had tied it in because of the symbol of the twentieth day of the ninth month. Right. Okay. The the day of the of the great rain before the temple, where the uh, the children of Israel were to give up their strange wives, mm -hmm. to be sanctified unto God. Yeah. And so we were trying to understand this. Um, December 25th. Now, the problem that we have in trying to understand these lines is because of the fractalization of these lines, we never, we, we, we weren't sure where we were. That is, what line were we operating on? We know on October 13th, 2018, uh, we believe that we were giving the midnight cry to the Levites. 
but that Le midnight cry to the Levites has been repeated again and again. It is right. We were zoomed into a fractalization that gave us November 9th, which is um, a symbol of the first day of the first month. It's also a symbol of midnight, depending where you're looking, because we know 9-11 is also the first day of the first month. So, so this right. has been a problem in trying to sort through these lines, is that we're, we never know where we are zoomed in. So if we're looking at this story here of, of judges, we know that it's a repeat of, in the story of Joshua. It's the same story, though it is talking more about its completion. That is, the story that we have in Joshua is talking about initially the, the challenge that was given um, because of the context in, wh in which it's writing, but it appears that this is going to be completed after the death of Joshua. So the story is told before the death of Joshua and after the death of Joshua, because the story starts before the death of Joshua and ends after the death of Joshua. Is that what we understand? I believe that's what what we were addressing because you were breaking up quite a bit. Okay. Yeah, I know. It says my internet's unstable. So, which would have something to do with my provider, probably not anything here because I've restarted everything. Right. Okay. So if we, um, okay, so from the chat, cherubim and palm trees depicted in the temple in Ezekiel 41.18, 2 Chronicles 28.15 also identifies Jericho as the city of the palm trees. Okay, that's where? Ezekiel 41.18. Okay, Ezekiel 41.18. Okay. So, yeah, it says, okay, well, because we have the palm trees mentioned in that they're um, on the door of okay. the temple, that's the inner door, there's going to be palm trees. Um, so it says in verse 19, so that the face of a man was toward the palm tree on the one side, and the face of a young lion toward the palm tree on the other side it was made through all the house round about. So we have these uh, cherubim and palm trees, which I, I don't know if that necessarily connects us to Jericho itself, but it does connect us to the symbol, which is relating to the seven times. And then, uh, and Second Chronicles 28, 15. Yeah, because that reads, and the men which were expressed by name rose up and took the captives and with the spoil clothed all that were naked among them and arrayed them and shod them and gave them to eat and to drink and anointed them and carried all the feeble of them upon asses and brought them to Jericho, the city of palm trees, to their brethren, and then they returned to Samaria. Mm -hmm. So, 
would we be in in this in this particular verse? Would we be looking at this that there were captives that were naked, and when they array them, they're giving them clothes. Mm -hmm. And they're putting shoes on their feet and they're feeding them. And then they anointed them. Is this not a symbol mm. of a change from the Laodicean condition? Yeah. So that's that's pretty interesting there. Um to put this symbol here, the city of palm trees, uh, in in connected with the Laodicean message. Okay. And also we have the the symbol of Islam. Right. Right. So. Hmm. But is this is this then those that are coming out of the Laodicean message? Yeah, well, and see this story I'm not that familiar with. So uh, now Judah's defeated here, but they're taking the captives and they're doing this, right? Hmm. But it's interesting. You do have these sim the symbol here. Doesn't matter necessarily the context. Okay. So there's something to tie in here with what we're talking about out of Judges, because we have the Kenites joining with the children of Judah. Yeah. Now, the point that I was asking when you were restarting was, would the Kenites necessarily have been precluded from joining with Judah since the father-in-law of Moses, whether we call him Hobab or we call him Jethro was a believer in God, but most of the Midianites were not. Mm -hmm. So were the children of Judah precluded from having the Kenites dwell among them? Uh, what, what do you mean by that? Precluded from what? Multiple times, the children of Israel are told not to make a covenant with the people of the land, the, Can the Canaanites. Yeah. And they were to drive them out. They were not to allow them to remain. Yet here we're being told that the Kenites, who were Midianites, continue to live among the children of Judah. Should they have been driven out? Hmm. Hmm. I don't know. Are the Ken Kenites? Oh, yeah. See, I just don't know enough about this situation and how it's to be understood. I mean, well, I, go ahead. Well, if they were joining Judah, would they not be seeking their God also? Yeah, that's kind of what it seems like to me. It doesn't seem to be a negative idea 
Well, when what I'm getting at is that when Jethro came unto Moses after the Exodus, he was welcomed. So Moses was recognizing that his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, was also worshiping God. Would that not be the case? Mm -hmm. So if this is the case, then the children of Judah are welcoming other worshipers of God to dwell among them. Yeah. That's the way I understand it. It reminds me of Ruth. I mean, she was a, a Moabite, but because she accepted the true God, she she was she was taken into Israel. Mm -hmm. And and that was the purpose of the Israelites is that they could be a witness. No disagreement. Mm. So as we were as we were going over this, then I'll I'll go back to this portion. So and the children of the Kenite, Moses' father-in-law, went up out of the city of palm trees. So they left Jericho and the children of Judah with the children of Judah into the wilderness of Judah, which lieth to the south of Arad, to the Negev, or the desert of Arad, which is, as, as I was saying, Hebrews 6, 1, 6, 6. We had said here that Arad would have a definition of fugitive, but also a connection with Islam. So the children of the Kenite, who are not part of the children of Israel or children of Judah has a connection again with Islam. Who would be the fugitive? And what is their connection with Islam? Hmm. Are the Kenites representative of some of those of the corporate church that come out? Or are they represented here by Arad? What other thing can we see here? Mm -hmm. I'm thinking of uh, Isaiah 16, three and four. It says, take counsel, execute judgment, make thy shadow as the night in the midst of the noonday. Hide the outcast, bewray not him that wandereth. Let mine outcast dwell with thee, Moab. Be thou a cover to them from the face of the spoiler, where the extortioner is at an end. The spoiler sees it, the oppressors are consumed out of the land. So a fugitive is like an outcast, and those verses just came to my mind. All right. But if we're looking at this as an outcast, fugitive and outcast can have very similar meanings. But if we're looking at this as an outcast, an outcast from what? Well, it could, could be Pete. 
people coming out of the mainstream church, people coming out, out of the world, people coming out of Islam. Okay. Three very good possibilities. Mm -hmm. But why would they then choose to leave Jericho? We recognize Jericho as being a center of idolatry. We recognize Jericho as being a walled city that was devoted to the gods that they had chosen to worship. Well, well Jericho is destroyed at this point. Right. I'm, I'm speaking of this portion from the book of Joshua. Oh. Okay. So, or where's that? Well, when, when we're looking at, when we looked and went through the study of Joshua, we know that when they came to Jericho, that the children of Israel did not defeat the children of, Israel, of Jericho. This was completely and totally by God's providence, right? Yeah. So now it's no longer being called Jericho. We're identifying it as being the equivalent of Jericho. And it's to be of the city of, the, it's identified now as the city of palm trees, a place where there is water because the palm tree only grows where there is good water for it. Yeah. So why are they leaving the water to go into the wilderness? Well, I mean, they would have been there just in travels, wouldn't it have been? I mean, they weren't living there. Because it went up out of the city of palm trees with the children of Judah into the wilderness of Judah. So... Um, so it doesn't really give us the background of this. It's just that they must have met there and then they traveled with them. Okay. And then we're being told that, and Judah went with Simeon, his brother, and they slew the Canaanites that inhabited Zephath and utterly destroyed it. And the name of the city was called Hormah. So we're told of Zephath and then Hormah. Are they two names for the same place? What do you think? Well, I think it's two names for the same place. Because when we take a look at this in 2 Chronicles 14, 10, we're given a verse that said, and then Asa went out, went out against him and they set the battle in array in the valley of Zephathoth uh, at Merishah. Now, Horma was the site of a great battle because we find that first mention in Numbers 1445. Then the Amalekites came down and the Canaanites, which dwelt in that hill and smote them and discomfited them even unto Horma. And it's followed up with Numbers 21 3, and the Lord hearkened to the voice of Israel and delivered up the Canaanites, and they utterly destroyed them and their cities, and he called the name of the place Hormah. 
So this would have not been Joshua, but Moses. Mm -hmm. So that, that portion, Numbers 21, gives reference to Arab, the king of a group of Canaanites, because 21.1 says, and when King Arad the Canaanite, which dwelt in the south, heard tell that Israel came by the way of the spies, then he fought against Israel and took some of them prisoners. And Israel bowed a vow unto the Lord and said, if thou wilt indeed deliver his people into my hand, then I will utterly destroy their cities. Then the Lord hearkened to the voice of Israel and delivered up the Canaanites, and they utterly destroyed them in their cities, and he called the name of the place Hormah. This is recorded as taking place just before the situation with the bronze serpent. So what else do we see here? Judah has joined now with the Kenites and he's gone unto Simeon, his brother. So they are, they're eliminating the Canaanites that inhabited Zephath. And the name here is now recognized as Horma, as Moses had first called it. What can we say about this symbol? I mean, name change, granted. That's, you know, a covenant, entering into a covenant. Well, but it's also, that, and it's also repeating something that happened earlier. Right. So why is this, is, why is this repetition happening? And what, symbology can we make from it Any ideas or any thoughts? Well, let's see. And Judah took Gaza with the coast thereof, and Ascalon with the coast thereof, and Ekron with the coast thereof. What is important about noting these three places in this verse? Are they not three of the five cities of the Philistines? Yes. Okay. So Judah is in faith, victorious against these cities of the Philistines. But as we go through this, as we continue in the book of Judges, they don't utterly drive them out. So 
in 119. Just, uh, just a note. Yes. Uh, although they, they become the cities of the Philistines, do we know if the Philistines had inhabited this area at this year time? Because we find them more sort of mentioned later on in Judges, but right. we don't really have any mention of them. When they first go into the Canaan, they're not mentioned with the Hivites and the Jebusites and so forth. So I'm just wondering, did they come in um, later? In other words, that they were a subsequent party. Yes, they were maybe brought in as a, a judgment, maybe later okay. on. I think they were dwellers uh, previously in um, Cyprus. I think historically, that's the sort of uh, information that I would understand, but well, I don't have that. It wouldn't be in the Bible, but. Uh, well, it depends what you call the Philistines, because it seems that name is used for different groups in the Bible. So there is the Philistines during the period of the judges, but um, the Philistines occur earlier. It's just a different group. Interesting. Okay. So Judges one nineteen, which is and can be said to be a representation of nine eleven numerically. And the Lord was with Judah. And he possessed the mountain, or he drove out the inhabitants of the mountain, but could not drive out the inhabitants of the valley because they had chariots of iron. What is this saying about the faith of the children of Judah? What is it saying about the faith of us in the movement today? I mean, the Lord made it very clear, didn't he? That he would go before the children of Israel he would drive out the Canaanites. So did they need to fear the chariots of iron? No. So in other words, they were victorious on those of the mountain, but not of the valley. What is the symbol of the mountain? And how can we apply that to our time? And in the same manner, what is the symbol of the valley? And how can we apply that to our time? Well, I'm not familiar with these symbols. I don't know how to, how to understand them. Okay. Isaiah, <clears throat> I think it's Isaiah 2 that talks about the mountain of the Lord's house. So a, mount, a mountain is like a kingdom. I mean, a mountain could represent the church, but usually it represents a kingdom. Okay. If I was to go back and look at some things 
as Father Miller would have looked at it, we would be looking at mountain and using Isaiah 2 verse 2 and Daniel 2.35 as references. So if I open Isaiah 2 verse 2, begin, well, I'll begin with verse 1. The word that Isaiah, the son of Amos, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. And it shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountain. And shall be exalted above the hills and the nations flow unto it. So the mountain at this point would be being seen as some type of a government government or a church right yeah question from the chat could chariots of iron represent the papacy using the u.s military Now, if I jump to Daniel 2.35, we find, then was the iron, the clay, the brass, the silver, and the gold broken to pieces together and became like the chaff of the summer threshing floors. And the wind carried them away that no place was found for them and the stone that smote the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. So in this, we're looking at one being a representation of the church, one being represented of God's kingdom. And it's interesting that they were calling it a great mountain. Or as they would say with the Hebrew, Rab Tuar. And the only place that, that that definition would come through would actually be in the book of Daniel. So. Mm. So they drove out the inhabitants of the mountain. They did not drive out the inhabitants of the valley. Trying to see if there's anything else here. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not seeing much from what Father Miller would have done. Hmm. So, any other thoughts of what we're looking at here right now with Judges one nineteen? So in other words, this valley taken from Hebrews, you know, Hebrew 6010 from the Strong's, Amek, is related to Hebrew 
a vale that is a broad depression, a dale, a valley, a vale, often used as part of proper names. So would we make the application that the inhabitants of the valley could be Rome? That's possible. So, so the inhabitants of the mountain are who? Who is it that we defeat and who is it we can't defeat? Did we define the inhabitants of the mountain? I mean, I, I think it's, it's part of the question. I mean, are we, are we looking at this that the defeat is one different is one party and the, the ones that live in the valley are another, or are they both part of the same group? I mean, all of this, all of this presents for us an intriguing puzzle. Mm -hmm. So the question is, how are we going to put it together? Well, so um, I was going to present some things, but I ended up losing everything. And uh, so I have to recreate it, but it wasn't much. Um, but um yeah for some reason this computer is not working very good anymore it's really really slow which could have been part of the problem but so when we go back to verse 16 if you want to go back there sure so so we had the city of palm, palm trees which we say is jericho right and and then it's in this next section we're going to deal with Judah, the, some of the places that they conquer. Right. But, but this part here, um, this is the Kenites going with the children of Judah. And they're leaving the city of palm trees. Well, they went up out of the city of palm trees. So that means they met there. Okay. Okay. Right. It doesn't tell us exactly why they're there, because this is a new topic. That's why we got that little paragraph marking. It's it's a different section on a scroll. Um, and and so there's going to be some people that joined them, and these are the children of the Kenite who who now believe in God. So who did we say these people are? The ideas that were addressed is, could they be people that come out of the corporate church? Could they be of Islam that comes to join with the, the people of God? Is it someone else? Okay. Now, the point that you were looking at when they went up out of the city of palm trees, mm -hmm. the other reference that was given that the translators used yeah. was Deuteronomy 34 to 3. Yeah. I'm just hang on a second. I'm having problems here. Just hang on a second. Okay. Okay. So, um, yeah. So, Deuteronomy 34 3. Right? Is that what you're talking about? Yes. Right. So we're going to go to, I'm going to share the screen. Let's see if this works. Okay. <clears throat> so stop your share there. But yeah, I was having trouble sharing anything or doing anything on this. 
Okay, so this is a chart of the 777 days from November 9th to December 25th. Now, we had made this comment regarding January 16th. That is, that's the 16th day of the first month. Right. Which is a symbol that we have um, because that's the day of the resurrection. Um, and, and we also can see it here in chapter 1, verse 16. It's just inverted. And that is a division of the 777 days. Uh, with 434 and 343. So we can see uh, Deuteronomy 34 verse 3 is represented here. Now, um, one of the things that we, that, that I want to address has to do with the first part, the 252 and the 525. So there's two verses. One is in 2 Kings 25.2, and the other is in Jeremiah 52, 5. Does anybody know what those verses say? Because my Bible program is not opening up. I mean, so if somebody could tell us. So 2 Kings 25, 2 and Jeremiah 52, verse 5. 2 Kings 25, 2. And the city was besieged unto the 11th year of King Zedekiah. Right. Now, both of them say the same thing. That is, they're identical verses. But they have this inversion of this other iteration of 252 and 525. Right. So the they're the, they're the same, but just inverted. And the siege, what is the siege in the 11th year of Zedekiah? What are they besieged until the 11th year of Zedekiah? So what is the siege? What, what symbol do we have for that? Isn't that part of the Sunday law? Okay. Yeah. So it's going to start on the 10th day of the 10th month, the siege, right? And it's going right. to end on the ninth day of the fourth month. Okay. Um, and Angela noted that the Kenite is mentioned in Numbers 24, 21, and 22 in Balaam's prophecy, which okay. I think is important. So, so we'll come back to that. So here we have um, this. Uh, symbol of what was my thought there? Okay, I can't remember now. Um, The, the siege being the 10th day of the 10th month, and it continues to the ninth day of the fourth month. And then it's followed um, 30 days later on the 10th day of the fifth month with the destruction of the temple. So there's this progression. The progression is there's a prophecy given in Ezekiel, and he's told to lie on his left side for 390 days and his right side for 40 days. And we have the symbol of the 391, and that's going to lead uh, to the siege, which happens on the 10th day of the 10th month in the ninth year of Jehoiachin, or not Jehoiachin, Zedekiah, ninth year of Zedekiah, 10th day, 10th month. And then it's going to continue. So it's a span of time that we have that is mentioned both in 2 Kings 25.2 and Jeremiah 25, or um yeah, 52.5. So Jeremiah 52.5. So now we have this similar idea is we have two different verses, and they're both verses that are addressing the city of the palm trees. And one is a symbol that we can take, and we can also apply it to this line that is uh Deuteronomy 34 verse 3 is going to take us from January 16th to December 25th. And, and that's going to be the Sunday law. And January 16th is um, the end of a 10-day period that began on January 6th. So what began on January 6th, 2021?
So we have January 16th here, but what began on January 6th? And and uh, Jeremiah 52, 5, according to Ran here, is the 1335th verse in the book of Jeremiah. Wow. Yeah. Okay. So on January 6th, a 10-day fast occurred, or not a fast, a day of prayer, or 10 days of prayer. And, but it's also the siege, right? It's going to be the siege of Washington, D.C., So that division of the 777 is, is connected to the division of the 252 and the 525. It's connected in the language of 2 Kings 25.2 and Jeremiah 52.5. But it also gives us July 18th. And we can see that January 16th is connected with the siege. And that siege is going to be how many days after July 18th? Oh no, how, how's it go? I think I'm doing this wrong. Because the siege is, is 187 days after July 4th, and then there's going to be 13 days to July 18th from the end of July 4th, which is a symbol of 18720. And from the beginning of July 4th to January 6th is 187 days. So we have all these different symbols of July 18th plus the 777. And then what happened on July 17th, 2021? That divides this 777 is to, as 616 and 161. Wasn't there some comment from Biden? And because this would have been about four days before he would have been inaugurated. Um, I'm talking about the July 17th, 2021. Okay. Right. So now I'm going to look at the third line. So we have the 616 and the 161. Right. And and that's you at um, presenting on the 160 okay. days. All right. 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 So on July 17th, you were presenting 160 days from July 18th. And the 160 days came from where? Where did you get the 160 days? As I recall, out of Ezra. Yeah. So it came out of Ezra. Ezra 10. Okay. So where was it from? It was 160 days. Do you remember? I don't remember quickly, no. Yeah, I, I don't remember actually either. But you had 160 days and you were dealing with uh, Ezra chapter 10. And, but I noted that it's 161 days that you were giving that message. Yeah, and, this because, was, and this was pointing to the 20th day of the ninth month, um, which is December 25th, 2021 on the biblical calendar. It's the 20th day of the ninth month. So this was this period of time that we had. Yeah, because we, we were in the process, we were going through this because Ezra 10, eight states that, and whosoever would not come within three days, according to the council of the princes and the elders, all his substance would be forfeited and himself separated from the congregation and of those that had been carried away. Then all the men of Judah and Benjamin gathered themselves together unto Jerusalem within three days. It was in it was the ninth month on the 20th day of the month, and all the people sat in the street of the house of God, trembling because of this matter and for the great rain. Right. I just don't remember where we got the 160 days from, where we were counting that. Um yeah, because I did the ordinal count, and then it was either you or Stephen that pointed out that it was 161 days. 
Well, yeah, but you're counting to December 25th, but I can't remember why you used 160 from, maybe it was just 160 from July 18th. Right. And I get yeah, I think that's just where it came from, but, but yeah, so you did, and well, it wasn't so much an ordinal count. It's just that we should have counted from when you were giving the message. Right. Okay. Symbolize that call to repentance, that three days. Right. Um, and we know at the end of three days is the 16th day of the first month when we talk about Christ's resurrection. Okay. The third day. So, so we have that same kind of symbol there. Uh, the point being that when we're looking at this story in Judges chapter 1, we keep seeing these symbols connected with this movement and connect, connected with Jericho, connected with um, uh, the symbols of this message, right? the second angel's message, the third angel's message. And the one... Yeah, with this, with the 161 as well. Yeah. That was also a symbol because this was Israel going into covenant with Rome. In, for our time, is this 161 a call for our separation from these, these covenants, especially with Rome? And, and I mean, this is all, all rather complicated. I mean, somebody watching this would have no idea what we're talking about, um, you know, who didn't know our message. But when we look at all of the different symbols, and we even see the 1335 there. So we know the 1335 symbolizes the league, right? Because it's 1335 years from the league made with the Gibeonites to the league made with Rome right in 158 and we know that there's the three days there or the three years from 158 to 161 bc you know with the other way around but 161 to 158 um and we so and we also have the 1335 connected to the 666 and that is 666 times two is 1332 and you add three, the three days and you get 1335. So if we try to put all this together, all of these symbols, the, the 525 dealing with the siege, uh, the 343 and the 434, those are dealing with, with what? I mean, they are dealing with the siege. All of these, in a sense, address the siege in some way. But 343 is 7 times 7 times 7. And that, that's going to deal with the Sunday law, which is tied to the siege. Correct? Okay. And the 616 and the 161... Are they not dealt dealing with covenant? Okay, explain further. As as I had just addressed, the 161 and the 158 with the three years in between were symbols of the covenant that Israel entered into with Rome. Yeah, so this which which is the league. The league, so yes. Isn't the covenant they should have entered into. Yeah, that it, it should never have happened. Right. Yeah, Jeremiah 616 is the return to the old paths. Right. Um and, and I was looking at that earlier. Now okay, we're we're coming to a point right now. I think we need to get into this deeper, but we're past our time. Yeah, I know. Um, okay, so and 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 so Jeremiah six sixteen is stand ye in the ways and see, ask for the old paths, where is the good way and walk therein, and ye shall find rest for your souls. But they said, We will not walk therein. But isn't that also giving us the same 
is that not the same kind of a call as Ezra made in Ezra 10? Yeah. Yep. And, and also this starts with, um, uh, 616. There's another place too. I'm trying to remember. I think it's, um, Isaiah 61. I can't remember where I was looking. I had this all prepared. Yeah. Isaiah 61, six, but ye shall be named the priests of the Lord. Men shall call you the ministers of our God. Ye shall eat the riches of the Gentile, and in their glory shall ye boast yourselves. So this is talking about the priests. Right. And also, if you look at Isaiah 61, 1, that's 1, 16 in reverse. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because he hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of prison to them that are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of the vengeance of our God, to comfort all that mourn. Okay, but if you if you take one other and go to Isaiah 60, verse 16. Okay. Thou shalt also suck the milk of the Gentiles and shalt suck the breast of kings, and thou shalt know that the Lord am thy savior and thy redeemer, the mighty one of Jacob. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we have this symbolism in here that this is about uh, the preparation of the priest to give a message. Right, exactly. Yeah. Which is what we've been doing. That's what this movement has been working on. And that's why we're studying. So anyway, as you said, we're, our time is up. So um, if you can close with prayer. Okay. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time that we were able to spend in study today. We thank you for the conversation and the input. We ask, Father, for your blessing upon the efforts of this day that you will show us that which you need us to do so that your character is glorified. Direct us in this path, guide us in these ways. For this, we thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.